Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to Music Network's Taking Charge of Your Performance Career 2020. Uh, this is the first in a series of four uh, speaking speakers, um, and I'll be followed by Steve Lindsay, Francis Mitchell, and Lisa O'Brien in the next few weeks. Um, I have to say this is a pretty strange experience. Um, I am streaming to uh, via Cisco WebEx uh, to Facebook Live, but there is a 30 second lag. So I'm kind of 30 seconds in the future. Um, and this whole experience of time, especially at the moment, is uh, particularly apt, I think. So here we are. And welcome to PowerPoint. No sound. Okay. Let's try and adjust things. Okay, you have it. You can hear me? Okay, I'm being. Let me start again. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to Music in the Digital Environment, uh, which is part of Music Network's Taking Charge of Your Performance Career 2020. Um, this is a series of four talks. Uh, the next three are by Steve Lindsay, Francis Mitchell, and Leisha O'Brien, and I'll be looking forward to hearing them also in the next few weeks. Uh, this is a pretty strange experience, I have to say. Um, I'm streaming via WebEx to Facebook Live, which means there's a 30 second lag. So what you're actually hearing is 30 seconds in the past, um, which is kind of a little bit head wrecking. I guess this whole experience of time is something that we're currently all getting used to. So my talk is focusing on musicians making music in the digital environment. And um, you know, it's also very strange to be giving a talk just to my laptop screen in a room, uh, kind of presuming that there are people out there listening to this. Uh, usually the way I would do this is to obviously prepare the slides, but then really just feel the room and um, you can kind of gauge the reaction and the response from people. And uh, there's a certain feeling so just me kind of talking here to a, a blank screen is pretty strange, but again, that itself is kind of uh, an indicator of, of how things are going at the moment. Um, and it's, it's a pretty small leap actually from doing that, doing a gig in your bedroom. Um, so in part one, which is today, we're gonna to be looking at making music. Uh, in the second part on Thursday, we'll be looking at sharing music. And obviously there's a lot of crossover between these. Um, in the second part, sharing music, I'll be really looking at kind of examples and a survey of how people are dealing with the, the current change um, and using digital technology to share music. Um, uh, in the first part, now making music, I want to kind of look a little bit more at the philosophy, I guess, of why we're making music right now. And what is music? What does music mean uh, as a musician? So I'm a saxophone player, saxophonist. Uh, I'm also a composer and I write music about a variety of strange things, including forest canopy ecology, uh, bird flocking, water, uh, the DNA of the orchid and its evolution through five families, a piece for solo cello I'm currently finishing for Kate Ellis. Uh, I've worked on astrophysics and quantum physics uh, in a work uh, as artist in residence in the European Space Agency. Uh, and I also work a lot with text, uh, including settings recently for uh, of Finnegan's Wake for Lena Andonovska, who we'll be hearing from a little bit later, uh, and the setting of T.S. Eliot's Wasteland and, and a variety of other stuff. Um, I also run an ensemble called Eurodney, um, and we would have been playing in Switzerland uh, next week. Um, and I am the co-director of Diatribe Records. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, I um, should also say that in the parallel universe, which split off, split off from us um, six weeks ago, I would have been on tour uh, for nine weeks, starting in New York. I would have been in London uh, this week with Gar San Lazar doing the second part of Beckett's How It Is, um, and heading off to the Ankara New Music Festival. But instead, obviously, everything's changed, and we find ourselves 
in a, a very strange new world. Um, and obviously, musicians are, are finding it difficult, I think, to react to and respond to the current changes in the environment and are particularly susceptible uh, to the kinds of changes which stop people coming together. And people coming together in space is something that I really want to focus in on. However, as, um, as Sammy Stein said recently in a, in a roundup of events for Jazz Views, creative people are being creative um, and they're dealing with things um, in new ways and accelerating their use of, of different technologies. Um, so we're doing things like playing gigs in our bedroom. That particular stage was over there. Um, as part of the IMC's Peace by Peace Festival, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that on Thursday. Um, in Tona Quinn's recent article, which I thought was very good for the Journal of Music, he talks about uh, a radical shift in music in the digital age, which is being brought on by the pandemic, um, and speaks a lot about how things will be irradicably changed by this, um, particularly from the point of view of promoters and how concerts will be produced um, and how audiences will be reached. Um, but I, I want to really talk about how musicians uh, are responding to this environment. So for, for any musicians out there who are kind of wondering, you know, how do I respond to this? What do I do? How do I continue to make a living and, and live in music? I would say the number one rule um, is to place music at the center to practice. And I gave this talk uh, in a different form. It was uh, musicians in the digital landscape a, a couple of years ago um, in a very different time when we were really um, just kind of talking about optimization of your website and social media and how to reach out to people. And there wasn't this sense of urgency uh, that we have now to use digital technology. Six weeks ago, I had never heard of Zoom. I'm sure most people hadn't. Uh, and suddenly you find it um, kind of embedded in your life uh, in a very, very um, central way. It's very easy to forget that as a musician, the most important thing you can ever do is to practice your instrument. And this extends obviously beyond building that relationship between the instrument and the body, or if you're a, a singer, obviously between the body and the body, uh, into the what practice in a wider sense. What is the musician's practice? What is our day-to-day -day reality and how do we live our life through music um, and it's, it's very easy even in the best of times uh, to get embroiled in social media and applying for things and you know booking things and you know musicians are always stretched between having to be your own promoter and your own manager and uh, your own designer etc etc um, but really, the most important thing is what do you sound like? And the only way of really developing your sound is to practice. And even though we're in the middle of a pandemic and a crisis situation, I think it's important that we maintain that relationship with the instrument and the body away from the screen. Even if you are a musician who works in a, in a digital media, if you're a computer musician, I still think it's important to have a tactile relationship with a sound making object. Um, so I really think that practice should be at the center. And you know, even now when we have all these different ways, um, what we're really communicating through the screen and through the, through the computer uh, or the phone is, what do you sound like? Um, so this is a shot of Lena Andonovka's flute and hands. Um, I, I really think it's important to carve out that time to just be with your instrument uh, to practice also, just as a side note, you should always sound terrible when you practice. If you sound great when you're practicing, you're obviously uh, doing something too well. Um, so let's take a little moment to just think a little bit more about what is the digital environment specifically. Um, there's a, a shot of the Silence project, and uh, which was looking at sensor augmentation of instruments. Um, so we now, find ourselves in this kind of world where things are happening in the cloud, where this talk is, in fact, is happening in the cloud. And there's a kind of a, a sense of the immateriality 
of the internet uh, and of the digital realm. Uh, whereas in reality, this is what the internet looks like. Uh, this is a server farm um, and housed in there are a whole load of servers which are actually the core of what the internet really is. And obviously, these server farms have a huge environmental energy cost. If you're lucky, they look like this. If you're not, they look like that. Um, and so it's important that we remember that giving over this space to digital technology is not without its price. Um, and especially now, when we've had this kind of pause, this moment where the world in a certain sense uh, has been able to, to heal from the constant onslaught of energy use and human consumption, we need to be aware that moving headlong uh, and with our eyes closed into the digital world uh, as some kind of a substitute for physical presence uh, is a suicidal path. Um, and we need to consider that, that there is a cost to all of this um, and that has to be weighed. And it also needs to remember that this cost in a global sense is generally borne uh, by those people who are not in the, the Western world, the developed world, but actually are at the cutting edge, or you should say the bleeding, the bleeding edge of where the raw materials for these energies are being sourced. Uh, and so that's, that's something we need to remember. Also, uh, on a kind of a wider point, the, you know, this, this is source code, more machine code, which is what digital technology boils down to when it's really applied um, at the kind of heart of the computer. Uh, and essentially, it's binary. It's a series of ones and zeros. And music itself is not that. Music is the curves in between. It's messy. It's chaotic. It's the body. It's gesture. Uh, this is a picture from the recent New Music Dublin Festival. Um, and you see Lena Andonoska, the floatist on the left, and a great floatist, another great floatist, uh, Claire Chase on the right. Uh, and Claire is performing a piece by Phyllis Chen um, called Roots of Interior which is for uh, flute, tape, and amplified heartbeat. Uh, and what the picture you can see is Lena attaching a stethoscope uh, to Claire so that her heartbeat is amplified in the space. Um, and I can't think of any greater piece which expresses that depth of, uh, of the body and its position in music. Um, and historically, of course, Music has always had uh, a social function. This is a painting by Peter Bruegel. Uh, and you can see here in the right-hand corner, the, the pipers are, are just a very small part of the scene and are just serving dance. This is the, um, the, the peasant sweating. Um, and you know, in this kind of uh, situation, the, the music is not placed center stage. It's not zoomed in on by a webcam with everything else kind of filtered out. It exists in order to serve the dance to the moment. It has a, a specific place and a specific time and as such has a specific meaning. It's not devoid or, or divorced from its social function, but exists uh, as part of a community. Um, and that's also something that uh, is at the very heart of music. Um, and again, as we transition uh, or negotiate this um, territory that we're in now, we need to remember that. Um, also, music is by nature um, a, a multitude of voices, a, a multiplicity. Um, Bela Bartok, uh, here the great Hungarian composer, used to say that in his expeditions of researching folk music all across Eastern Europe, he would always go to the villages on the borders um, because the musicians in those villages between two different communities um, would learn the repertoire of both communities so they could get gigs at both of the weddings. Um, and that cross-pollination of material always meant that uh, the musicians were the best. And that's where new compositions would tend to emerge from, was from that joining, uh, from that multiplicity. Uh, and it's important to remember that that multiplicity also exists in music itself, in performance. Right now, I'm giving a talk. I have no idea how many people are listening to this, but I can't hear you. I can't see you. Uh, and this is 
amplified right now, but it's a general aspect of speech. Speech is monophonic. If two people speak at the same time, you can't understand each other. Music is not like that at all. You can close your eyes and listen to everybody around you whilst playing, and you can hear yourself and you can hear them. Uh, and in fact, the sum is greater than the sum. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, so just to spend a moment on the idea of what is technology. Uh, technology is a compound word coming from the Greek words techne and logos. Uh, techne is art, craft, making, skill. Um, but logos means word. Um, so historically, actually, the roots of the word technology are the speaking of something in its, uh, of its craft. When, Arch when Archimedes invented the screw, the technology of that was not the object itself, not the screw that was driving the water up. It was the way he would explain that to somebody else. It was the understanding through language of this invention. Um, and it's only actually in, in recent times that we've externalized this idea of what is technology. So when I say technology now, you imagine this laptop or the phone that you're watching this talk on, and it's outside of the body. Whereas actually language is a technology and music as a language has the potential to be a technology itself. Music can be a way of understanding the world. And Jack Attlee makes the point in his book, Noise, that music also acts as a, a harbinger. So music foreshadows what is to come. Um, and it acts uh, as a kind of uh, a barometer of change. So, he mentions, for instance, that uh, when the musicians moved from the royal courts to the uh, to the merchant houses, uh, this kind of foreshadowed a general shift in power in society from the the center from the from the monarchies uh, into a, a kind of a burgeoning merchant class. And again, when music was first recorded as an object in the late nineteenth century. That foreshadows a kind of a commodity objectified economy, which is to come in the 20th century. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves now, as musicians who are actually shaping the current time and shaping what music means to be now, how will that, as a technology, change and affect the world that is to come? Uh, and that's a responsibility that we have. The great quote by Atali. What is noise to the old order is harmony to the new. And that just shows how things change. And, you know, as musicians, therefore, we have to understand ourselves as architects of this change. And the way that we use technology and digital technologies has to be part of that shift. Um, this is an amazing building by the British architect Thomas Heatherwick that was designed for the uh, Pavilion Ex Expo. UK Pavilion for the Beijing Expo in 2012, I think. Uh, and it's called the Seed Cathedral. You can see each one of these rods, which form the, the outside structure of the building, uh, contains one of about 20,000 seeds that were housed in Kew Gardens uh, and formed the seed repository. Um, and so each sound that we make, each moment that we play music, that we live in music, is actually one of these seeds going on to form the architecture of the future. Uh, to spend a moment, I'm, so I'm flying through this because this is a, a half an hour talk, uh, but to talk a little bit about the environment that we find ourselves in right now, one thing which is really changing um, is the way that we are sharing music uh, at the moment without being able to be in the room with other people. Um, and so certain things are coming to the fore and, and shifting. Um, and one of the big things is that now, if people are not hearing you in the room with through the air and the instrument and their ear, what they're actually hearing is the recording. Um, this is a Telefunken U47 large diaphragm condenser microphone. Um, uh, it's one of the, the world's greatest microphones, but this costs about 10,000 euros to buy. If you're sitting at home with one of these, you don't need to be listening to this talk. Um, but 
This also means that now the cost of making music sound good to those who listen to it um, has suddenly uh, become prohibitively expensive for a lot of people to make music that sounds good, even if uh, you know requires the the technology, the objects uh, with which to do it, but also requires the the recording setup, um, and effectively means that musicians now are thrust into this position of having to be a sound engineer um, and having to understand how to record sound, which is a completely different craft, and be able to afford uh, the studio equipment with which to do that. Um, obviously, this is uh, the way that things are going now. Um, and I do agree with Tony that I, I think this will be a kind of a, a marked shift, which won't simply um, go back to a new normal afterwards. So we need as musicians to respond to this. Um, one thing I would recommend um, for those who do want to dive into this uh, is Reaper. Reaper is a, a door or a digital audio workstation, uh, which is an open source software. It's, it's community driven and it's um, over the last 10, 15 years, it's become as good as any other uh, professional software out there, but it's practically free or has a, a very small, I think I paid $40 to take away the, the pop-up screen at uh, the start when you open the program. Um, and you know, if you are a musician right now and you're looking to find ways of performing it and this, you probably do need to look into this and Reaper uh, is an excellent place to start. Another thing that's obviously happening is as we are brought into musicians' homes for, for these performances, which has its, its pros and cons, um, you're going to be seeing them through a webcam. See, again, the quality of that depends on the quality of your webcam. Um, and also, if it's pre-recorded, um, which I actually think um, is in, in many ways a better way of doing these things, um, you're going to also be coming across that musician's editing skills the most part if they're at home. Again, DaVinci Resolve um, is an excellent video editing software which has um, a free version which is almost uh, has almost the functionality of the paid version. Uh, and it's definitely something uh, that you should check out if you're going down that route. Um, you'll also probably have to find yourselves uh, digging into giving PowerPoint presentations on WebEx to platforms such as Facebook Live. Um, so uh, I, I'm reading a book at the moment by the great Australian writer, Lynn Siegel, and she quotes in that book, um, this quote by Adam Poche, who says, joy breaks down the boundaries that separate self from other. It bestows a glorious we mode upon earth. And I, as soon as I, I read that word, I thought we mode, that's, that's music. Music is uh, the we mode. Music is in the, the first person plural. And she goes on, the desire to move outside and beyond oneself, the search for some sort of shared laughter or joy, one with another, that we mode is certainly one way of overcoming the gloom that can threaten to engulf us. Um, and I, I can't find a, a better way in language of describing the sensation of playing music on stage. And you know, musicians will, will know that when you play a great gig, what makes that gig really great is the feeling of connection, of, of joining with all of the musicians on stage and with all of the audience in the room. And there's that kind of shared moment of togetherness. And you know, a, a lot of people actually listen to concerts with their eyes, I think, and they look at the musicians and they can see these points of connection. They can see when they're hooking up, you know, these kind of things. And then they know, OK, this is a great gig. Know? And this, uh, you know, when you finish a gig like that, uh, you come off stage and the first thing you go and do is to hug all the musicians and embrace them and, and hold them close. And it, it's kind of like those, those hugs after a gig like that are kind of drops that are falling off you, drops of water that are, that are falling off this body as you've come out of the sea. The, the, you've been in the sea of music, you've been together, you've been immersed, and you come out of it, uh, and you're still so close to people that you're, you're touching them, and those 
are like these drops falling off this, this body. Um, and this is a, a great photograph by Olesa Storobetska from that gig uh, at Nemeth Dobbin. And you can see this, this is uh, Lena and Claire with Masti Jacobson there in, in the foreground. Uh, that's what playing together and being together and making music together feels uh, feels like. And you can see you can see the the passion and, and the embrace and so it's it's this really which is at the the heart of music um in its messy joyous joyousness um, and it's this that we need to hold on to and it's the flame that we need to keep alive um as we transition into being uh in these different environments uh, so coming to the end now uh, i'm going to ask people if you do have any questions uh, i'll be taking questions for about 15 minutes at the end uh, maybe type them into the facebook comments now so that i'll get them uh, by the end of the talk i just wanted to share with you um, a little video that we launched today uh, from the new music dublin festival which i think kind of helps to sum up the some of the uh, the ways I feel about music, and we all feel about music here in Dublin and in the making community. Uh, so I'll let you have a look at that. Um. <laughs> ago um, when we were in a room in the National Concert Hall uh, playing together and you know I remember Guillaume Morty running around with the saxophone and, and playing into people's faces and you know it was it seems now like a, a completely different time uh, it's amazing how quickly uh, things have have changed and uh, you know I I, I don't want this talk to seem uh, kind of overly negative about the ways that things are happening. There's also been some very beautiful things that, has hap that have happened as a part of this. Um, you know, and there's been a lot of online concerts that I've been at where musicians have been there from all over the world watching and, and listening together. And you know, friends of mine here who have small children who may never have been able to come out to gigs that, that much are suddenly, because they're at home, they're able to. Uh, share in these and partake in those kind of experiences um, and I'll be talking a lot more about this on Thursday um, but there's a, some really heartwarming stories of how in the current environment people are coming together um, and finding ways to transcend um, the limitations in physical space um, that have been imposed on us by this crisis um, and use whatever means they can, uh, you know, creative people being creative to find ways of coming together and being together. And one way that I'm absolutely sure this will affect things in the future is that we'll never again take the experience, the, the, the privilege of being a musician, of being able to share music and togetherness with other people in a space uh, that we grew up with, that I grew up with, um, you know, and have had the, the fortune to travel around the world doing, we'll never again um, take that for granted and we'll always realize how special that is. 
Um, so uh, I think we're coming on to the question space. Thanks for listening uh, and for sticking with us at this time. Uh, if you don't want to ask uh, questions in the Facebook stream, feel very free to email me. Uh, that's my email there, info at nickrossmusic.com. Um, and you can find me on uh, Twitter at Kayamai. Um, okay, so I'm going to have a look at the questions now. Thanks for listening. Uh, question from... Do you think the performing live and alone to an unseen audience could or should change the way we practice for our performances? Uh, then replying to me, Sean Alman, and how we present ourselves. Um, no, is, is the short answer. No, I, I don't think it changes the way that you should practice for the performance. I, I think we have to imagine when we're doing these kind of solo performances uh, at home to an unseen audience you have to imagine that you're with them and that you're all there together in the space and that you're transcending the technology technological uh, boundaries between you and you know it's the only way i could actually give this talk right now is to imagine that i'm actually talking to somebody um, and that somebody is kind of nodding and smiling and has any idea what i'm talking about i certainly don't um, and i think the same is uh, is is in playing music. You you have to you have to practice the instrument so that you have a fluidity with it and that you're comfortable with the material that you you've embodied the material, um, and then you transmit it through whatever form. Um, what, one one thing I would say about that, just looking at differences between um, live and pre-recorded things. Obviously, when something is going out live, as this is. Um, it's in real time. There's no possibility of going backwards and undoing, uh, you know, bad takes, sentences that you started um, that didn't end where you thought they were going to. There's been plenty of those, um, you know. And I got, when I'm giving this talk, I'm I'm not reading the notes. Uh, I'm this is me talking to people. But I could only do that if I'm imagining real people in in real space. And and I think that playing music is. Um, is very much the same. You have to imagine it. Um, one of the experiences that I had last week doing a, a duo uh, performance for Piece by Piece with Alessa Dorovetska, um, you know, we actually were pre-recording that, so we had the capacity to do multiple takes, and that actually uh, can get messy, you know, because you're not in a studio, you don't have these kind of the clock ticking in the same way that you do. Uh, and musicians are all perfectionists, so there's a tendency to like, oh, maybe we'll do one more take, or should we try this? Should we try that? And suddenly, you know, you have no objective sense. So um, there's a lot to be said for just being in the moment, transmitting, uh, and sending it out in real time. Uh, another question from Finn there: How about Pro Tools first versus Reaper? Uh, I mean, for me, the 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 big difference between Pro Tools and Reaper is how much it costs. Um, Especially now with the, with the current model of Pro Tools, where it's a, a monthly subscription, uh, I just can't justify paying that amount of money when Reaper will do everything um, that the Pro Tools would do. And actually, you know, I, I was talking to Alex Bonney about this recently. Uh, the BBC have just moved over to using Reaper. Um, so I don't think the Pro Tools is the industry standard that it was, uh, and certainly for the money that it costs, uh, I don't think it is. Uh, is high quality recording essential for music making at this time? What about old recordings that are great but not up to modern modern standards? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I think it very much depends on the type of music that you're playing. Um, the the kind of live stream performances that I've watched that I really enjoyed, even though they were uh, just somebody's phone. Uh, you know, thinking of Cormac Begley's live stream uh, on Facebook Live for the island performed from his uh, his caravan and Kerry. Uh, I mean, it's an amazing performance um, and, and moment. Um, but he's playing um, one instrument, which is primarily melody driven, um, which is almost entirely melody driven. Um, 
and so it translates there's, there's there's much less of a kind of a loss of of um information whereas if you're playing music that uh, has a lot of complex textures um that uses a much wider bandwidth you know that has 20k low hertz signs or 20 20 Oh, sorry, 20 hertz low low sub bass or 20k uh, high frequency passes, um, and that's a part of your music that you ordinarily would have done, you know, in a 5.1 surround system in, in your venue. Um, in that situation, or if you're playing improvised music that has lots of dense textures, in that situation, there'd also be um, a lot of loss. And and so, I think, yeah certainly the the performance can be enjoyed no matter what um, quality it's at but i do think it depends uh, what kind of music it is and what the instruments are um oh sorry i can go to full screen so you can actually see me um, hello um so from Paul Kachenko, hey Paul, <laughs> you're in Moscow. Um, I think you can fake enjoying performing. I've experienced this when doing long runs. Audience members comment to me, you guys look like you're really enjoying it. The honest truth is that after doing it a hundred times or more, we were just rehearsed to give the impression that we were no hugs after those gigs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it happens. Um, and, uh, you know, we can learn behavior through the body, but still, it's a detritus or you know it's a physical memory of what that experience was um, at, at the beginning and what inspired that kind of behavior or that uh, physical uh, motion and you know I mean professional musicians especially if you're doing a you know a hundred a hundred run 100 gig runs um, it becomes muscle memory um, it becomes something that you're just doing by route that you don't even need to think about or be conscious in. Um, you know, and it's at that point that you stop enjoying it, I think. It's, it's only when you're really in the moment, in the body, in the space, um, that you can experience that Wii mode and that it's, a, you know, it's that sense of togetherness. Once you start to lose that, that, um, that consciousness or that, that bright piercing gaze uh, into all that is, that you can experience your music, it's, it's, um, you get jaded yeah, quite quickly. Um, and one of the great things for me, and the reason why I do so many different things, uh, is that music allows you to do uh, lots of new things and to learn about things in a different way. And you know, it's that curiosity, I think, that sense of freshness that keeps um, the music alive. And if you are just repeating things uh, several times, sure, you can get into uh, a kind of a locked behavior and become numb uh, to the joy. But I mean, that's, that's the same about anything. Uh, Alex Roth, hey bro. Uh, how do you think the current trend of free live streamed gigs will affect the economic value people attach to musical experiences once the lockdown is lifted? Um, yeah, I mean, the whole financial system the whole uh, economic system needs to be really looked at right now um, and revised. Uh, and I don't just mean for musicians playing gigs. I mean, coming to the end of a capitalist society. That's what I think we're seeing uh, a crack in at the moment. Um, and musicians, again, are being this kind of barometer of change or, you know, sensing a harbinger that music is suddenly becoming free to be perfectly honest i think music should be free i think music is something that we should share with everybody you know i don't think that we should have to make money by doing music i don't think actually money should exist um i'm glad that no one can talk back to me now uh holly negrada how far away do you think technology is from allowing us to perform more naturally in virtual performance? That's a very good question. Um, so I'll be coming onto this a lot more on Thursday um, when we talk about models that, that exist. Um, I think, uh, well, the, the, bottom, the bottom line is right now we're not there. Um, I, I don't want to go too much into the, the detail because I will be talking about this a lot on Thursday, but um, 
the, the first ever internet broadcast was by Future Sound of London, a record called ISDN in 94. Um, and since then, there's been quite a lot of people exploring um, internet broadcast and networked music. Um, and Shane Latimer told me recently that um, there was a networked music festival that ran for a few years in Birmingham and closed up in 2014 because no one was really that interested. And they've suddenly just announced uh, an open call because now it's the new thing. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people out there have experienced trying to rehearse or teach via Zoom or WhatsApp or Skype. And, um, you know, the bottom line is that these, are, these platforms are optimized for speech. Um, so generally they have ways of, of adding limits or, or um, uh, gain shift so that one person speaking can be heard above all the others. This is terrible, obviously, for music. Um, but I'm pretty sure that, you know, since the lockdown at, at the start of March, all of the people who were working on this are suddenly going full tilt at it. Um, you know, in many ways, this is the, the musical vaccine at the moment for surviving in the digital world. We if we're going to go this route, we do need ways that we can hear people in HD, in real time, uh, in, in, multi in multiplicities, in, in ensembles. Um, how far away exactly? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not an expert. Um, but I would imagine that however far we were two months ago, we're a lot closer now. Um, okay, I think that is all of the questions. Um, so uh, it just remains for me to say thank you very much. I hope you're all well and, and safe um, and take care out there. Um, and I'll be talking uh, more about this kind of sharing side of things um, on Thursday. I hope you'll join me for then. Uh, take care.